So, here we are today in Kathmandu in Nepal, um, and uh, I'm talking to David Hayes, who was giving uh, a couple of plenary speeches here at the NELTA conference. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, so, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into English teaching? What's your experience? Many years ago. <laughs> well, my, my first degree is in history, and then I went for teacher training, and my second subject was English. And, and then after that, I, I, I didn't want to teach immediately in the UK, so I, I applied to VSO, mm. who said, well, history is not much good to us, is it? What about teaching English? So I, I did. I went to Nigeria as a VSO for a couple of years, and then came back to the UK, applied for jobs in schools, and they, I initially applied for jobs as a history teacher. And they said, well, you may have a may have history teacher training, but you actually haven't been doing it. We have been teaching English. Mm. So I didn't get a job as a history teacher. And I eventually got, I applied for jobs as an English teacher. And so I taught um, in the UK for a while. And Was then that in secondary schools? Secondary or? school, comprehensive schools. Mm. I did some battle training yes. in the UK comprehensive schools. It toughened me up a bit, yeah. And, and then after that, I went and, and did a um, RSA um, diploma. Okay, like it the, would be the Delta kind of It would of be the Delta, thing the Delta yeah, yeah. So yeah. It was called something different to yes, the of course. So it was Delta. Yeah. And, and then I went on VSO again. Okay. Uh, and I went to Sri Lanka for the first time. Um, and that was a bit tricky because of the, uh, that was 19, long time ago, 1982 83. Okay. And the Civil War started in July 1983 in Sri Lanka, so I had to, I left quite hurriedly, and um, then moved to, I went to a job in Senegal, French West Africa, and so from there on, you know, it was, it was English all the way, yes. and then I followed the usual path, I, I did an MA um, at Lancaster, as many okay. people did, it was, it was fashionable at the time, you know, with, program, uh, I think. Yeah, it was a good program, Chris yeah. Candlin, Mike Green, Dick Allwright, and Norman Fairclough, and all those people. So it was a really stimulating place. Yes. And then after that, I, I went to work on British government projects in Malaysia, four years in Malaysia, and then Thailand for another couple of years. Um, after that. Then I went back to the UK, and I taught at the University of Leeds for four years, and then went back to Sri Lanka again, uh, managing a project uh, for the UK um, Department for International Development, a okay. funded project managed by the British Council. Okay. What was, kind of project was that? That was uh, initially was there. It was initially it was going to be three years mm. as a teacher training project, but then we seem to be doing okay with that, and so the project was extended and expanded. So, and I was actually there for a total of six years. So we, apart from the teacher training, trainer training, curriculum development, we, we helped to develop a new curriculum for primary schools for English, and then we had the textbooks for that, grades three to five, and then we were developing supplementary readers also, but not just for English, but also in Singular and Tamil. So that was six years, which was a very, very interesting period. I'm sure, yeah. And then, after that, what did I do? I went back to the UK my chronology right. Uh, and went back to the United Kingdom and stayed there for a while. And at that time did, did some consultancy work and finished off a, a much delayed PhD. Mm. Actually restarted to be quite honest. Finished off, we restarted. And then once I'd finished the PhD I thought I'd better get a proper job. <laughs> Full time job. Finally. Finally, <laughs> finally. Before it was too late. Yeah. And and then I got a job at um, in Canada Brock yes. University. Yes, yes. And there were some things you know, on offer in the UK at that time, but uh, this it seemed the best thing to do at the time. Yeah. To, to, so I've been now in Canada, for, this is my ninth year, wow. which is the longest I've actually long spent you stayed in one place. In one place ever yeah. in life. So <laughs> I'm probably stuck there. You must be feeling a bit itchy by now. I guess. Well, this is why I keep, I keep leaving and sort of coming on over to, not just for conferences, mm. um, but with the associated um, work from monitoring and evaluation of projects and developing new projects, particularly in service teacher training. 
Um, so that, that's generally what I focus on. And teacher education is your focus in yeah, yeah. Canada, so you're working with novice teachers or...? or well, we have, yeah, we have a BA program, mm. so, teachers, so it's preparing teachers in, in TESOL, mm. and also we have the MA program. Mm. So I mean, it, it's interesting as well. Yes. And yes. Students, are, students are great, actually, so sure. it's just nice to be there. Yeah. Oh, well, let's move on to, to your um, uh, plenary from yesterday, right? Yes, yes, yesterday. We've had a couple. The, the mm. one yesterday, especially, I wanted to talk to you about. Um, this was, let's see, teaching, learning, and context, what we can learn about innov uh, innovation and quality in ELT from studying the lives and careers of English language teachers. So that's a quite a mouthful, isn't it? isn't it? I think, I think that might have been extended. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's basically about um, focusing on teachers. Well, it caught my eye, but yeah. you know, obviously, this website Wait. is called The Lives of Teachers, so. So I'm very interested in the lives of teachers, and, and you were talking mostly about, um, well actually, you've done projects in Sri Lanka and Thailand yeah. that, that you were focusing on for yesterday's talk. Right? Yeah, it's because I have a long-standing mm. association with Thailand, mm. but I, mean, I worked there for, for a couple of years yeah. before I went back to the UK, yeah. and, and so and I keep going back. But I think what you talked about would be applicable to lots of different contexts. Well, that's what I find when, yeah. when I talk about the, this kind of thing, and I do talks like that, focusing on that. Mm -hmm. And then people come up afterwards and generally say, well, I know it's about Sri Lanka, I know it's about yeah. Thailand, or whatever. But, but we, it could, be, it could be describing our situation. Yeah. So I think oh, there's a lot of commonality for, you know, for teachers across the world, and the kind of conditions that they work in, yeah. the expectations on them, and so on. Well, I can. I, I mean, I took a lot of notes, so I can just run through and prompt okay. you. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about each thing. So, um, first of all, you were talking about uh, the consequences of ignoring teachers. So, you sometimes, maybe sometimes or oftentimes, yeah. teachers tend to be ignored by the policy makers. Yes, yes. I mean, teachers are oftentimes ignored mm -hmm. um, because I don't know. I don't know why they're in a lot of places, they're, 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 it's very hierarchical. So if the minister, for example, says something, then everybody just agrees and jumps to do what the minister wants. In some places, and in other places, well, they're always being pushed to develop things too quickly. And if anything I've learned over time, particularly my six years in Sri Lanka, things take time. Yes. And, and people don't often allow the amount of time that's needed for some kind of innovation to take hold. Yeah. And they don't consult enough, they don't plan enough. They don't find out what it's really like for teachers in the ordinary classes. Can they actually do it? And so, particularly with English language teaching, there's been too much looking to you know, the latest fashion. Well, I suppose there's, there's very little to gain for a, from a politician from setting something in process which is going to benefit his or her predecessor or well, successor. That's, right? that, that's you know, truism of politics yeah. throughout the world, wherever you are. Yeah, yeah. Ministers have to make an impact. Yes. Okay. So the system is set up for them to do things differently to their predecessor. Yeah. Always. But the, it's a shame. The faddy aspect of, of language education, I think, is, is sometimes a problem, isn't it? it? It's very much a problem because we, we move from one fad to another. Yeah. So we move from community of language teaching to task based language teaching. And now we talk about things like content and language and directed learning, CLIL, yeah. English medium, and so on. It's uh, a never-ending yes. journey through acronyms. Yes, yes. Yeah, teachers do love an acronym yeah. as well, I think. Um, but then more positively, you talked about why do people become teachers? And I think actually the overall message was very positive talk. It was quite uh, it was quite uplifting to think about some of those well, things. Yeah, I think it is positive because most teachers I, I find throughout the world um, are busy trying to do a good job mm. because they want to help their students to learn. The circumstances surrounding their job sometimes are really difficult, but it doesn't mean they're any the less committed. What kind of um, what kind of motivations did you find in the teachers that you talked to? Well, the various kinds of motivations. So sometimes, um, well, with older teachers, often their parents have decided mm. for them it is that they should do, particularly for female teachers in some societies, and they, because it's seen as a safe profession for women, um, which is you know, a bit condescending, a bit demeaning, but um, that, that's the reality. 
nowadays, of course, people have more choice, and unfortunately, fewer and fewer people really go into teaching because it's their first choice. Mm. Those people still do, mm. and often and when they do it, it's because they've been. I think they have a love for the subject. Mm. Yeah, people, people actually genuinely like English. Yes, yes. And then they see it as a as a means of enriching other people's lives, mm -hmm. and they want to pass it on to other other people. And then people go into teaching mm -hmm. because they actually like teaching itself. Yes. And sometimes people go into teaching because it, it's um, it's a secure job, provides them with pension, and if they're from you know the less well-off families, and, and it represents a sort of an, an, an advance to them. It's a respectable It's a respectable profession, profession yeah. 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 Even though it's not often a well-paid one. No. It's a respectable profession. At least you have respectability. Yeah. <laughs> and then you were, you were talking about some of the realities of teaching, so there were a number of those. So the first thing is that kind of classic quote, here is the book, go and teach. Yeah, it's yeah. The book is the curriculum. Yeah, the book is the curriculum. Yeah. Which underlines the importance of having good books. Mm. Because often people, I, mean, I know many schools these days do have you know, more, more resources. They have, if they're lucky, they have internet, they have computers. But also many places don't. And my, for my, my commitment is really to those places that don't. Yeah. Because in, in a way, I'm not so interested in better resource places. I'm, no. I'm more interested in the, in the, the less well resourced places. They're probably the ones in that. And, they're, and they're, it's, they need the most support. And, and the book is what they've got. And so often the teachers are not so well trained. And so the book sometimes functions as, as a training tool as well. So if you have a good textbook, and you have a good teacher's book in the first language. And then it shows them how to how to do things. Have you seen improvement in quality of materials over the, the last sort of few years? Of in, in in many places, yeah, mm. many places. But for me, what's critical when you're developing textbooks is is what we did in in Sri Lanka. Our textbooks in Sri Lanka weren't, weren't written by me. Mm -hmm. my, well, my, the person who was working with me is a curriculum consultant, but by teachers themselves. So what we did was to get we held this competition for writers and we selected primary school teachers with potential and so we, we trained them in, in the processes of writing materials for writing putting things together in textbooks and that way the materials which we developed were directly relevant to, to the schools and, and sprang from teachers experience so they, they knew what worked mm. much better than I did because they were, they were going there and trying to materials out on a daily basis. So they stayed in school uh, as teachers and we just, they just came out from time to time to do these workshops on writing materials and then they went back and tried out some things and then revised them and then eventually we put it all together. That's a very nice idea. I think sometimes I, I see you know textbooks and, and these days you get the DVD and the CD-ROM and the workbook yeah. and, and, and Yeah, it's great if you can. It's, it's all too much actually, I find. It's, uh, not necessarily appropriate for for your context, you know the big international yeah. textbooks I'm talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. something a little bit more hand the, the like that. And, and the well, I wasn't going to mention any names, right, but, okay. <laughs> but, they, but but they are good at what they yes, do. Yes, they are. Yes, they're not bad books. But no, 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 by no means they're really good books for particular context, mm -hmm. particular settings. But that's more the private language school mm -hmm. setting, uh, which which you know they they have the computers in the classroom. Sure. They can use the CDs and the DVDs and so on, but but for us, schools didn't often in Sri Lanka. Not all schools had electricity, yeah. so you know if you don't have electricity, then you can't have the CD ROM. You don't have the kind of DVDs or CD ROM. So it is only the textbook. Um, and the next thing you mentioned was the mother tongue use of the mother tongue or the first language. And actually, there were a lot of conversations about this at the the Melter conference yeah. this weekend or this week. We've heard, I think. Because in the past, people have said, oh, you shouldn't use, if you're teaching a language, then you shouldn't use the children's first language. Yes. In our case, you should only speak English. Mm. And I've never seen the sense of that. I really never have. I can understand it when you have a multilingual class. Yeah. And obviously you can't. Well, isn't that where it comes from, really? Isn't it that kind of Euro European language? Yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. Really yeah, and then that's just been exported to yeah. the context where it's not really appropriate. Yeah. So for me, if you're here in, in, in the classroom in the park, why wouldn't you 
use Nepali, yeah. which for some children is the second language anyway. Yes, exactly. And so I don't, I don't understand why you would only use English when you can use Nepali or other languages yeah, to yeah. help support the, ter- the teaching of English. Yeah. And that's it. It depends how, as long, as long as you're not translating everything into Nepali, yeah. you're using it as support. And then, then for me, that's fine. I think so too. It's balance. Yeah, balance. And then we came to the dreaded uh, examination washback. So please enlarge mm. on that. Well, that, that, that afflicts many systems yeah. throughout work. Here it's the school leaving certificate. And in places like Korea, where I've been several times, it, the university entrance exam mm-hmm. at the end of high school dominates everything. And yeah. people are preparing for this for years ahead. And children in, in South Korea go to school, go to night school, have one, all with this, this aim of, of getting into the, the best university and they having to get good schools on this entrance exam. Now, if, if, if that entrance exam or school leaving certificate doesn't match with the school curriculum in the way that it approaches you know, the, the testing, then the, the, the ways of teaching in school stand no chance. Because yeah. everybody gets judged on your school leaving certificate results or your university entrance exam results. It's what we call high stakes testing. Yeah, it's very high stakes. Extremely high stakes. Extremely high stakes. So you, you need to have a, an exam which matches the, the, the actual school curriculum. Mm-hmm. And they don't, they rarely do. This is, uh, I mean, of all the things that you discussed, this is one of the things which I think is, is perhaps the hardest for us to, to, to uh, address. Well, it's hard. It's very hard to change mm-hmm. because um, it, you know, it was always inertia. Yeah. And also, if you if you want to have a, as many places do, you have a curriculum which, which focuses on on using the language and becoming, at you know, it's, it's a practical tool. Mm-hmm. It's not a, not something that you want as a, an object of study. Languages you you use them mm-hmm. <laughs> to communicate with people. But that means that if you, if you, with testing, that's difficult. Yeah. Because if you have you know tens of thousands of children and you want to test their speaking, okay, you can't that, bring everyone that's in really them. really difficult. So so the exams focus on, on things which are easier to to test. And the last of these kind of uh, realities of teaching is that talking about methods, methodology. Yeah. And again, that's something that was discussed quite a lot at this conference yeah. at NELTA with um, there seemed to be quite a, a kind of clamour or a little bit of confidence about trying to build a, a, a kind of native yeah. I mean a Nepali kind of uh, methodology yeah. and not just importing yeah. from the native speakers all the time well there's been way too much deference to yeah. in terms of methods to yeah. what's been coming out of Britain and the US and people abandoned their traditional ways of teaching and think that this is, this is better, it will work. They, they don't. Um, because they're not they aren't they aren't rooted in the context. So yeah, I mean it's great to look outside and see what's happening in other places and then taking it and, and adapting it for your own circumstances. But you can't take things wholesale and expect them to work in other places. Mm-hmm. Then they need to have some kind of legitimacy in the context. And so I, I I would fully support people just doing what they think is best for them. And that actually extends to the individual classroom because teachers with experience know what works for them in their classes with their kids. And I think we should trust teachers more to do what's right, for what they know is right for their, for their learners. Um, so a kind of closing question then. Um, so all of the things that we discussed, what do you think the, the implications of, of this for for, um, for teachers, teacher educators, and policy makers? Like? Well, they need to listen. <laughs> well, for, for policy makers in particular, they need to spend more time finding out about the realities of their own schools, and not just the schools in the big city, not like not here in Kathmandu, they have to go to the remote areas. Which it seems something that Nelta is doing. Nel- quite Nelta, well. Nelta does that. Hard. But then, that Nel- Nelta is, is great mm. with all of their branches. Mm. They, they have an amazing network. 
But that doesn't always feed back into the policy making. No. Um, or it doesn't seem to. Um, so I'm sh quite sure Delta tries to make representations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the policies get changed to, to suit the context. And so and then that, the problem is also, you might, you might then, then end up thinking, well, Kathmandu is different to the rural area, so do, do we then have one kind of curriculum for Kathmandu and one for the rural areas? And if you do that, are those children then further disadvantaged? So there's a really, really, really difficult balancing act because you, you need to make sure that wherever children are, they get something which is good for them. But also you have to give children from the rural areas the opportunity to progress. They, they need to be able to have the chance to go to university, to become teachers, to become accountants or bankers or doctors or whatever they want to be. So it's a question of how do you best release that kind of human potential and make sure that there is there's equitable access. The kind of things that one of the teachers I was quoting said, education is all about opportunities. And and policymakers' job is to provide those opportunities equally across the entire country, not just for the, the kids in the big cities. Well, and I think they can do that by, by addressing listening to teachers more. Well, let's hope that that happens somewhere along the line. Let's be positive. Well, all, yeah, we, I think we, because policymakers, then, as again, as one of the teachers from Thailand said, they have good intentions. Yes. Okay? And they, they genuinely do have good intentions, but the intentions don't necessarily match with the reality of teaching and learning for, for all the teachers. So they just have to try to make this fit a bit more. For teachers and ed teacher educators, which are the other two groups. Um, again, teacher educators, um, sometimes they haven't been in the classroom for a while. Mm. And so I think one thing that was interesting for me when I, I worked in Malaysia a few years ago um, was that um, teacher educators, teachers from the training colleges, every so often they, they were sent back to schools mm. to teach. And so they had to rediscover their classroom teaching skills. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not something which happens very Actually, often. Actually, that was something... Did you mention that on the first or the second day, that the, the way you get to be a teacher educator is just by doing it for long enough? Yes, yes, Being a that teacher, was the first day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just get moved up. Well, the, it's the village elders. You've, you've yeah, you've been doing yeah. it, so yeah. now teach. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily work. No, right? no, but also, I mean, it, you, when you move away from the classroom... Mm. If you don't go back, just to mm. sort of, sort of reskill, if you like, or even if you just don't go back to to, to watch classes mm. and observe classes, and you stay in the college, then you forget I think what it's like. Yes, so definitely. then you can't really, you're not really preparing the teachers mm. for the reality of, of the classroom. Mm. You're just there with, with this ideal in your mind. Yes, I mean, I remember doing, when I did my master's degree, my tutors were right there alongside us, because I was also teaching at the same time, and they were right alongside us in the pre-sessional courses, you know, doing yeah. the same kind of thing, so, and that, that definitely came across in the way that they, they taught yeah. us. They did know what they were talking about, but as you say, a lot of often that's not the case. And teachers, the final word? Teachers, the final word. Well, teachers obviously are the most important. Yes. In the system. Yeah. And they receive the, the least credit and the most blame, generally. Yes, certainly the ones who yeah. get blamed. Yeah, yes, if, if the results are not good enough yeah. and this kind yeah. of stuff. Um, so they have a difficult job, a really difficult job. But again, m most teachers teach because they, they want to teach, they enjoy teaching, they, they like you know, the learning, they want to see learning in their children. So against all the odds, they carry a lot sometimes, sometimes against all the odds. And, and what happens is that the, the, the rewards that they get is what, what has been called the psychic rewards of teaching. It's the connections that you can make in, again, at any level with, with the, the, the learners in your class. You can see that they're making progress. You can see this, this joy of learning. And that, that sustains you in your work. And sometimes there's all kinds of nonsense happening outside the classroom. But you, you know that you're doing a good job with your children in your classroom and you use that to sustain you. 
and so for teachers, I think, I think they, they in those sort of those moments of when they have doubts, they just have to have self belief, belief in them, belief in what they're doing, because they can see that the kids learn, and that that's where they, they have their, their greatest joy, the joy of learning. Okay. Well, I think that's a very nice positive yeah. note. We've managed to find one to finish. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're very well.